Hello everyone, I'm uh, Justin Steinberg um, from the Department of Romance Languages and Literature. Welcome back to our first ever Virgilio lecture series. Once again, I want to thank the Virgilio Foundation for generously supporting uh, this series, which allows us to invite a prominent intellectual artist from Italy each year to give a series of lectures and collaborate with our undergraduate and graduate programs. As with the previous lecture, I will, now, I will now hand over the introduction of Professor Cavarero to a colleague uh, who has been especially influenced by her work. Today's lecture will be introduced by Professor Alessia Ricciardi. Um, sorry, I lost my place. Um, the Herman uh, Pierce Miller Research Professor at Northwestern University and current chair of the Department of Comparative Literature. Professor Ricciardi's interests um, include uh, French and Italian contemporary literature, cinema, political philosophy, psychoanalysis, and gender studies. Her first book, The Ends of Mourning, was published by Stanford University Press in 2003, and it won the MLA Scaglione Prize for Comparative Literature. Her second book, After La Dolce Vita, A Cultural Prehistory of Berlusconi's Italy, was published also by Stanford in 2012, and it won the MLA Prize uh, for Italian Studies. Her most recent book, Finding Ferrante, Authorship and the Politics of World Literature, published by Columbia University Press in 2021, examines questions of Elena, Elena Ferrante's identity and authorship in the context of contemporary world literature, with particular emphasis on the rarely noticed importance of German literary and cultural influences. I happen to know uh, that this book was especially influenced by Cavarero's research, and in particular by her volume, uh, Relating Narratives. We're thus lucky uh, to have in our midst a colleague who for years has engaged seriously both with the work of Cavarero and Ferrante. So uh, thank you, Alessia. If you could kind of please step forward to the podium. Let's give her a hand for generously introducing her. Thanks, thanks, Justin, uh, for your generous introduction. So it's a, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to introduce the third of the Virgilio's lecture this evening. As Adriana Cavarero has been for me over the years an infallible guide to our contemporary literary and intellectual debates. Adriana Cavarero is a professor emerita of philosophy of politics at the University of Verona, Italy, and has been visiting professor at the University of California, Berkeley, the University of California, Santa Barbara, New York University, and Harvard University. In 2016, she established the Hannah Arendt Center for Political Studies in Verona, uh, Italy. Her English publications include In Spite of Plato, Feminist Rewritings of Ancient Philosophy, 1995, Relating Narratives, Storytelling and Selfhood, 2000, which in Italian has the decidedly more beautiful title, Tu che mi guardi, tu che mi racconti, Filosofia della Narrazione. For More Than One Voice, 2005, Horrorism, Naming Contemporary Violence, 2008, Inclinations, a Critique of Rectitude, 2016, and Surging Democracy, Notes on Anna Arendt's Political Thought, 2021. She is not only the author of groundbreaking works of criticism, but a founder of vital political communities. And she, had, <clears throat> a, 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 she was one of the crucial protagonists in the formation of the Milan's Collective's uh, Sexual Difference Group, which, as Linda Zerilli has argued, exemplified commitment to a political project of world building rather than to the propagations of essentialist philosophy of gender. Cavarero has expanded in her own original ways Arendt's focus on the unique relational status of identity, a condition in light of which literature may be seen as the decisive field of understanding rather than philosophy, which too often presumes the universality of its truths. She teaches us that there is a necessary other in charge of our life stories, 
As for, um, as for her, the self is not the result of a personal memory, but rather of its expressive and relational context. No less a voice than that of Elena Ferrante has emphasized for us the importance of this insight regarding the connection between the individual subject and the historical world. In Ferrante's most recent book, Immagini e il Dettato, translated as In the Margins, on the pleasure of reading and writing, she indeed acknowledges the debt that she owes to Cavarero. The novelist confesses that after writing La Figlia Oscura, The Lost Daughter, she had reached a creative impasse, which she was able to overcome only by reading relating narratives. The notions of the necessary other and narratable self that Cavarero develops in this book led Ferrante to abandon the solipsistic approach of her earlier works in favor of the more dynamic tableau of the Napolitan novels, whose protagonists, Elena and Lila, may be said to represent a narrative in stereoscopic vision. We may add that Ferrante's sympathy with Cavarero extends to a shared delight in Mediterranean and classical myths, a way of achieving a symbolic and cultural depth of field while clarifying the unique and singular scene of the present. Those of you who are familiar with Ferrante's writings know the importance of Dido in the Tetralogy of the Napolitan novels and of the myth of Leda in The Lost Daughter. During this Virgilio's lecture, we witnessed how compelling, pro, uh, compellingly productive this territory is for Cavarero. A second lecture on Euripides Bacche already has unveiled for us the hermeneutic centrality of the uncanny in the literary imagining of maternity. She provides us with nothing less than a completely new way to make sense of the tragedy through an elaboration of the topics of zoe ontology the Bacchant's participation in the flow of life, and the delirium of a hyper-maternity that is not solely destined to the human. As she arrestingly demonstrates, it's the intensification of the nutritive dimension of women's body, their ability to offer sustenance for the living being, including animals, that results in the play uncanny forms of feminine ecstasies. If then the Bacchae continues to speak to us in the most pointed and challenging ways, it would be not because the tragic protagonists of the play in their frenzy refuse the domestic sphere or work, which Bonnie Honig recently has suggested, but rather because they reject the very foundational promise, premise of anthropocentrism. Returning to the subject of tonight's third and final Virgilio's lecture, we may recall that the representation of tormented motherhood is one of Elena Ferrante's most enduring themes. In particular, in The Lost Daughter and the Napolitan novels, this problematic is inescapable and, to my mind, explodes beyond the more conventional and bourgeois terms um, of mere ambivalence a discourse that we are more likely to encounter in the work of Rachel Cusk, Sheila Haiti, or even Jacqueline Rose, to mention a few authors and critics who lately have flirted with exploring the difficulty of motherhood. For Ferrante, the question of motherhood as the consistency and intensity of an engrossing and enigmatic fascination, not simply with ambivalence, but with the uncanny. This is why I, for one, am impatient to hear and to learn from Cavallero's lectures tonight, titled Speaking from the Maternal Womb with Elena Ferrante. Please uh, join me in thanking her for her presence, welcoming her to our company, and applauding her enduring brilliance. Thank you so much. Alessia Ricciardi, it is an honor for me to be introduced by uh, Alessia Ricciardi because she's a specialist on uh, Elena Ferrante, I'm not. So it is my honor, Alessia, thank you so much. And uh, this is an opportunity for me to mention that Alessia Ricciardi is among contemporary literary critics focusing on Elena Ferrante's work. 
and it is very important. It is uh, a, a mark of the great success of Erna Ferrante and uh, her belonging to the contemporary, not only contemporary literary tradition, but also contemporary literary theory, because Ferrante as well, she is an author of uh, literary essays, among them the Frantumalia, which is a big volume, and uh, I'm, I'm happy about that. <laughs> Together with, with uh, Alessia Ricciardi, I want to mention among the most interesting uh, Isabella Pinto, Stiliana Milkova, and Teresa De Rogatis, for example, but they are many. So, one of the most interesting literary phenomena of the last decade is the extraordinary international success of the Italian writer Erna Ferrante author of a series of novels known as the Napolitan novels. Elena Ferrante is a pen name, and until this day, the true identity of the novelist remains unknown. I am particularly intrigued by Ferrante's works. First, firstly, on the narcissistic level, because of the, of the thing that uh, Alessia Ricciardi mentioned, and because Ferrante says that I was among her inspirators. So, of course, on the narcissistic level, I'm very intrigued by it. <laughs> Secondly, on a more significant level of feminist theory, because Ferrante's texts offer crucial insights for rethinking women's subjectivity and other essential feminist issues. One of these issues regards the theme of motherhood, a crucial theme because, as Jacqueline Rose has pointed out, Ferrante's, quote, lack of inhibition on the subject of mothers plays a decisive part in her extraordinary success. And motherhood is the irredu irreducible core of her fiction. Ferrante herself observes in Frantumalia that the literary truths, literary truths, of motherhood is yet to be explored. It is essential, she claims, to describe the dark side of the pregnant body, which is omitted in order to bring out the luminous side, the mother of God. This dark side corresponds to the generative process of the living matter, pulsating within the maternal body. And it is obscure because the image of the mother of God as a representation of a happy, self-sacrificing mother possesses a blinding luminosity, one which drags all idyllic representation of motherhood into its cone of light and pushes the female experience of the pregnant body into the shadows. Moreover, the image of Mary and baby Jesus an icon that has become familiar the world over through the work of great artists far beyond the Christian universe is the most symbolically powerful image within a cultural tradition that celebrates the relation between mother and son, relegated to the shadows, the relation between mother and daughter. This is an important point in my paper. There is an essential connection in Ferrante's text between the task of rendering in words the literary truth of the dark side of motherhood and that of recounting the relation between mother and daughter. What unites these tasks, and indeed makes them inseparable, is above all the presence of that which Ferrante herself calls the tremendo, a term rendered in the English translation as formidable, tremendous, or awesome, but which, in my opinion, is much closer to the semantic zone of the uncanny. Even if we don't know her identity, we know that Ferrante has a background in classics. The uncanniness of which she speaks, the tremendo, 
cannot but evoke the Greek word deinon, a term that refers to something scary and disorienting at the very limit of the utterable, something that, although inherent to humans, questions the most familiar features of the human. As Ferrante suggests, exploring the dark side of motherhood and the mother-daughter relationship means investigating precisely the uncanny knot in which this side and this relationship may contact, latching onto each other. Or if you allow me to put this in a more philosophical way, if birth as a coming into the world is the origin, there too the mother-daughter relationship finds its origin. If birth from the body of a woman is the appearance into the world of the singular individual as incarnated uniqueness, then it is there too, immersed within the infinite chain of generating mothers, that the daughter rather than the son comes in first sight. In her novel, The Days of Abandonment, Ferrante claims that to write is to speak from the depth of the maternal womb. To speak from the maternal womb is not merely a metaphor here. In literary fiction, Ferrante claims, you have to be sincere to the point where it is unbearable, to fill words with truth so that the narrative becomes true in itself means, above all, becoming aware that the maternal womb provides the place of origin for that embodied singularity which we are. <clears throat> A stake, quote, is that sort of original fragmentation that is bringing into the world, coming into the world. I mean, feeling oneself a mother at the price of getting rid of a living fragment of one's body. I mean, feeling oneself a daughter as a fragment of a whole and incomparable body. Of course, a song is also clearly such a fragment. Every human being is born from a mother. But the male body cannot be inscribed into the genealogy of the singular living organism, which by breaking itself apart, generates another singular organism. Uh, of course, the truth is always a suspicious term in philosophy. And I must confess that to get philosophically closer to Ferrante's literary truths about maternity is not easy undertaking. Of course, as a feminist, I find it easy to accept Ferrante's invitation, quote, to see ourselves outside the tradition through which men have viewed, represented, valued, and cataloged us for millennia. Yet exploring in depth Ferrante's concept of the uncanny of motherhood presents a far greater challenge. Significantly, she underlines that the experience of the pregnant body brings us not only very close to our animal nature, to the animality of the human be being as such, but beyond this, to our being organisms of a larger and more general living matter, which precisely in the fact of pregnancy, birth and childcare, manifest some of its processes. In particular, Ferrante stresses the typical female attraction or repulsion toward the animal world and hence toward the animal nature of our bodies, which put us in touch with the, this is Ferrante, the living matter where language becomes reticent and leaves a space and close between obscenity and scientific terminology where everything can happen. 
What Ferrante means, in my opinion, is that the mediation of words proves weak when faced with this feminine bodily experience of living matter pulsing through one's vein, an experience that allows the pregnant woman, or the woman in labor, to perceive, this is Ferrante, the instability of the forms assumed by life within the dark scenery of the original fragmentation. Motherhood is uncanny, above all, because it forces a stable form of life to use a formula, an individual conscious ego, to come to terms with the impersonal process of infinite life that her body is carrying out. Indeed, tried and tested for describing motherhood according to the traditional canon, language does not have words for its dark, uncanny side. It struggled to express, this is Ferrante, the standard of vain blood, liquids, flesh, that is our body. When the pregnant woman feels the rhythm of living matter pulsating inside her. In my opinion, this explains why Ferrante declares that her main challenge is to speak about the dark side of motherhood, to write from the maternal womb. And it also explains why, by focusing on motherhood, she decides to engage in telling the truth as only literary fiction allows one to. Crucially, Ferrante revealed in an interview that she has been greatly influenced by The Passion According to G.H. of Clarice Lispector, a book she defines as extraordinary. Lispector's text recounts the day of the life of a Brazilian woman who, without leaving her comfortable apartment, nevertheless exits from the stable form of her organized ego, melting into the cosmic primal dimension of an infinite piece of meat and of the forbidden fabric of life, the hell of living matter, of raw life. <coughs> G.H., the protagonist of the book, which truly is an extraordinary and challenging book, recounts an itinerary of passion, at times mystical and religious, that brings her to understand the transformation of organic matter in the female body as illimitable and ineffable life, that is, to feel the working <coughs> of a metamorphic circuit in which, what? Matter vibrates with attention, vibrates with process, vibrate with inherent present time. The landing point of this itinerary of passion, which passes symptomatically through a communion with animality, symbolizing the text by a repulsive cockroach, is the version, is the vision of the immense vibrating matter of which everything that individually lives is only a temporary expression, an unstable form, Ferrante might say, within a darker, swarming reality of raw, unlimited life, what I call Zoe. Tellingly, as an organized system, the delimited form of life that each of us embodies, the ego, the individual does fear the threshold between the singularity of the self and the swarming sea of infinite life, the terrible general nature, as Lispector says. This threshold can clearly be identified with the moment of death, the dissolution of the ego into undelimited living matter. But in Lispector, significantly, this threshold instead evokes birth. For her, the female body experiences the, this threshold 
as an animal body of great moist depths in which life itself procreates through the 15 million daughter of the great chain of mothers as put into the world. The great chain of mother is an expression by Lispector. In other words, motherhood goes to the very roots, the generative core of living matter, a matter, quote, of the body that precedes the body, because it is above all the pregnant body in its own generative flesh that experiences the uncanny, Lispector says, the horror of the threshold between the living self and infinite life. In this sense, motherhood is the site of the relation in which the vibrating female body reveals how the human being precisely in the phase of gestation and in the moment of birth is inserted into an infinite and non-human circle of regeneration into the general flow of Zoe. In truth, as respect of rights, there is a non-human trait to this contact with, quote, an existence satisfied with its own process, deeply occupied with no more than its own process, and the process vibrates entirely. Significantly, J.H., decisive step in her journey toward the horror of a row in the limited matter, is her meeting with a cockroach whose body she crushes with a cupboard door, forcing forth a thick and disgusting fluid from the insect's body. Here, we are confronted with the disgust and repugnance of the ego, as a singular and delimited form of life, in front of unlimited and undifferentiated living matter. For human beings, repugnance arises from the site where the borders containing a single form of life, the ego, disintegrate, where living matter exposes its impersonal, indifferent process exhibiting the sick plasma that erupts from the cockroach body, the very same plasma from which we too are made. Indeed, language that attempts to describe the experience of the uncanny must above all deal with this repugnance for the disintegration of borders, of margins, that ensure a stable form of life for the ego, an ego that, as respect of rights, is perhaps nothing but an accretion of the impersonal plasma of life. It is no accident that respect or insists on using the word horror, underlying that the uncanny nature of this horror exceeds the word as such. As I argued in my book, Horror is, one of the characteristics of the phenomenology of horror and of the disgust that horror provokes is precisely disfigurement, the dismembering of the singular body as a delimited, bounded form. In this sense, horror and uncanny are two attempts at naming the same ineffable feeling of repulsion. There are pronounced mystical and religious tones in the specter of the passion according to G.H., which Ferrante symptomatically does not repress. Clearly, that which interests Ferrante most, he recounted the literary truth of the uncanny, <laughs> recounting the dark side of motherhood and the relation of mother and daughter that the patriarchal tradition has either ignored or covered up with edifying imaginary. Not by chance, in Ferrante's description of motherhood, there is very little of the edifying imaginary. 
her texts challenge the socially and religiously constructed stereotypes of the nurturing, self-abnegating, and asexual mother. It is worth stressing again that her portrait of maternity are dominated by repulsion as the essential experience of the uncanny. We find this in her novel, The Lost Daughter, whose protagonist, Leda, a delinquent mother who has abandoned her daughters, thus describes her second pregnancy. The creature I was carrying in my womb attacked my body, forcing it to turn on itself out of control. My body became a bloody liquid. Suspending in it was a mushy sediment inside which grew a violent polyp. So far from anything human, the teeth reduced me even so it fed and grew to rotting matter without life. The theater of origins, that sort of original fragmentation that is bringing into the world, coming into the world, summons this Perante, the blind cruelty of living matter as it expands. Indeed, a stake is not simply suffering or a difficult pregnancy or the pain of giving birth, but an encounter with the fleshy juncture of the uncanny in which singular forms of life and living matter are entangled. Ferrante often uses the term smarginatura, that is, the dissolution of margins, to describe a phenomenon that, in the specific instance of motherhood, represent the breaking apart of one organism boundaries into another. I want to stress that there, is no, there are no mystical accent, accents in Ferrante's writing on motherhood as an experience of the dissolution of margins internal to the singular body and within the impersonal swarm of life. Nor are there vitalist tones. Indeed, far from being vitalistic, her vision can be defined, this is how I define it, materialistic. Rather than focusing on the vital process of effervescence and creative energy, Ferrante's attention falls on the attractive repulsive core of the uncanny that characterizes motherhood as a material and fleshy site of origins, of our coming into the world as individual organisms, single form of existence. If that is the dissolution of the singular form into general pulsating life matter. Birth is the singular maternal body participation in the labor of organic life as the generation of another living singular, indeed unique being. Needless to say that the dark side of motherhood does not relate at all to scientific knowledge of the biological process of generation, which science and technology have today rendered fully visible. It relates instead to the maternal experience, the intimate, visceral experience of the two-in-one, of splitting apart the singular flesh, of germination within a singular form of life, the very visceral experience that canonical representation of motherhood, as evidenced by the luminosity of the mother of God, live in the shadows and condemned to invisibility and ineffability. Significantly, while engaging in telling the literary truths of the uncanny of motherhood, Ferrante also narrates of pregnant women who, as in the case of Lila in the Napolitan Quartet, put up resistance, more or less spontaneously aborting the pregnancy. It is again interesting to see, to quote Lispector here, who in the Passion tells us how the protagonist had chosen to have an abortion in the past 
Because during a pregnancy, quote, the pores of a child were devouring like a mount of a waiting fish. Pregnancy had been flung into the happy horror of the neutral life that lives and moves. This is Spectre. Notably, also the French novelist Annie Arnaud, winner of the Nobel Prize of Literature for 2022, in her book The Happening, which describes her experience of abortion, develops a very crude and realistic narrative of the topic. To use the formula of Ferrante, Ernaud too engages in the task of speaking from the womb. I'm quoting Ernaud. I finished putting into words what I consider to be an extreme human experience, hearing on life and death, time, law, ethics, and taboo. An experience that sweeps through the body. Maybe the true purpose of my life is for my body, my sensation, and my thoughts to become writing. In other words, something intelligible and universal, causing my existence to merge into the, live, the lives and heads of other people, end of quoting. I'm sorry, I don't have the time to, to quote other important page by Anir, no? Uh, and her proximity to the approach of Elena Ferrante to the topic of maternity. You have to believe me. Let me underline that there are no moralistic tones, no regret or repentance in relation to this description of the choice for an abortion. The focus of a no Ferrante and inspector goes rather to an experience of the uncanny that can even seem intolerable due to its disgusting, repugnant nature, up to the point that the body, the body itself, the incarnated ego of the pregnant woman, sometimes spontaneously refuses it. Put another way, the dark side of motherhood questions the truths of the experience of procreation in which human beings fragmenting their singular flesh into another singular flesh, are forced into a knowledge of the impersonal nature of living matter that constitute both their substance and origin, are forced to taste the disgusting bodily and psychic depth of the dissolution of margins into the general flow of life. Thus, an exclusively female phenomenon, pregnancy, allows one to understand the essential truth of the human condition that the other sex is not permitted to experience. Furthermore, it is precisely this specific human-female experience that demonstrates the essential bond between mother and daughter even if the daughter is never self-pregnant and might never self-give birth. While the song is excluded from the bodily experience of the uncanny, in terms of origins, the female body is always a potentially generative one. It is the body in which human life takes its millions of unique, irreplaceable, singular forms through the 15 million daughters to which the great chain of, mother, of mothers has given birth. There was this spectrum. As human of the female sex, mother, mother and daughter share a generating body. They share a potential, a potential to face the uncanny of origins within the vibration of vital matter that works within their womb. As Ferrante does not fail to remind us, menstrual blood is part and parcel of this working. For women, the dark side of motherhood is already there in adolescence. In other words, 
The female body precisely in its incarnated singularity is connected to origin, to the flow of Zoer, long before the act of procreation, and even if a woman, a woman does not herself ever procreate. This how to facilitate the daughter identification with the identification with the mother. That is a relation of similitude and complicity. But in Ferrante's text, as it is true to life, this relation is instead often described as a rife with torment and conflict. Often, in her novels, the maternal figures are subjugated to the patriarchal order, wretched women that their daughters fear to reincarnate. Yet Ferrante crucially calls on the, quote, exclusive love for the mother, the single great tremendous original love, the matrix of all loves, which cannot be abolished. For women, she adds, every relation is of love is based on the reactivation of the primitive bond with the mother and manifests as the troubling law for the maternal image, the only love conflict that in every case lasts forever. Even while in Ferrante's words, the maternal body as a pregnant body is repellent as everything that refers to our animal nature, it also, this is Ferrante, emits an erotic vapor that will always be for the daughter both a cause for a regret and a goal. It is worth noting here that we are well beyond the banal pop psychology and even beyond the field of psychoanalytic speculation around female childhood and young girl's attachment to the mother, which Ferrante, quoting Melanie Klein, claims to know well and appreciate, but which she requests we do not overestimate when interpreting her novels. In my opinion, let me repeat, it is rather a materialistic feminist perspective to render Ferrante's novel particularly insightful. Tellingly, Ferrante does not hesitate to criticize the artificial and false reciprocal fascination between mother and daughter that is often presented as idyllic love. Far from recycling tri stereotypes, her novel explored the various configurations of the mother-daughter relationship. There is even a role reversal that makes the daughter into her own mother's mother. This is not in the usual sense of an aging, sick mother who the daughter must take care of with maternal inclination, but rather in the much more disturbing sense of a daughter who carries her mother within her womb. In the Napolitan Quartet, Lenny's dying mother reveals to her that the most beautiful moment of her life was when her daughter ex had exited from inside her. Lenou then notes that when she embraced me before I left, it was as if she meant to sleep inside me and stay there as once I had been inside her. The psychoanalytic paradigm of the dying human being who returns to the maternal uterus is here clearly and paradoxically remodulated as the slipping of the mother into the womb of the daughter, a regeneration of the mother within the daughter. Here the daughter reverses the arrow of time and forces temporality itself into a bodily circularity in which life becomes a perennial regeneration with death torn away. A reversal circuit for which, from which the song is clearly excluded. As a matter of fact, the work of regeneration, the labor of origin, pertain exclusively to female bodies. Namely, 
Also in this case of circuit reversal, the femoral body is exalted for its degenerative potential, the germinating flesh of an inextinguishable life, in whose nation status daughter and mother met and interpenetrate each other, even if paradoxically, according to an overturned genealogical temporality. We might consider this overturning as part of a fabulation connected to a vision of the human condition, experienced within the fleshy knot of its origin, or from a philosophical perspective. We may speak of materialism, if not of bioontology, or rather of zoontology. With Ferrante, as well with the Spectos and their no texts, however, we are very far from the varied constellation of style of thought that in Italy and elsewhere go today under the rubric of biopolitics. Rather than life as bios, in fact, what is here at stake is zoe, life as procreation. In other words, Ferrante and the other novelists I mentioned above focus on the issue of origins as the fragmentation of a singular form of life that, through generating a new singular form of life, experiences the generation of living matter within its own flesh. Namely, the issue of the human condition of natality investigating within the visceral depth of becoming body. In this sense, in conclusion, the literary truths of motherhood about which Ferrante writes seem to me not only important narratively, but also philosophically, precisely because it invites a traditional ontological perspective of philosophy to return to the issue of origins through the material, freshy horizon of life without sentimentalism or technologies, and most of all, without indulging to speculative abstraction. In other words, it invites patriarchal metaphysical ontology to turn into feminist materialistic zoontology. In conclusion, it is certainly true that Ferrante is not a philosopher, but a storyteller. But I do believe that there is perhaps more material truth about the human condition in her stories than in that which the speculative eye of the philosopher contemplates. As a feminist theorist, I see the importance of these material truths, and while reading Ferrante's novels, I understand why millions of women here in Italy and in all the world appreciate her texts enthusiastically. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for this amazing talk. Um, I was so interested, and maybe this will give you a chance to say more about Erno, maybe, uh, but I was so interested in this um, question of la smarginatura and uh, the, the the solution or you know the the breakages of the self in in this account and the relationship between that and the question of abortion I mean it's difficult not to ask that question here um, but in the sense of what kind of uh, agency and subjectivity are left in this account it is not a question of subjectivity and it is not a question of agency I mean, there is all of a feminist tradition, I belong to this tradition, focusing from a political and ethical perspective or ontological perspective on uh, women's subjectivity and capacity to act and so on. Uh, this was not my perspective here. My perspective is to consider kind of direct knowledge, human knowledge, mm, visceral knowledge of being part 
of the world of human being being part of the world of Zoe and a knowledge that implies the contrast to an anthropocentric vision of the relationship between man and nature, between the human being and nature. And it is very interesting that uh, I didn't mention Sambrano, for example, because I had at the time. But also in Sambrano, Maria Sambrano, she's a, a very good philosopher, a bit mystical, very, very I mean, particular, particular philosopher. And, um, and also in Sambrano, you have this perception of the whole of life mm, and uh, uh, this perception, mystical perception, of the dissolution of the ego, of the form of life into the general being, in the general uh, nature. Um, of course, as you understand, this is part of the history of philosophy. I mean, you can construct all a, a very interesting st philosophical stream, mystical stream, dealing with the merging of the ego into being. Mm. But what is interesting, in my opinion, is that in this philosophical stream, uh, typical mystical, mystical approach, you are always caught uh, in metaphor, alluding to abstraction. I mean, you can have carnal metaphor, fleshy metaphor, religious, Christian religious, fleshy metaphor. But at the end, uh, you have a representation in which the body doesn't play a very important role. And what interests me is that uh, in, in these women novelists, contemporary no women novelists, uh, mm, the relationship, uh, the experience and knowledge by part of the ego, by part of the human being, singular human being, of uh, his or her uh, belonging to Zoe, to the flow of Zoe, is connected to the experience of motherhood. Mm. This was what interested me. And in my opinion, this transform uh, the ontological problem of uh, the dissolution of margins from a metaphysical turn to a materialistic zoologic approach and language. Mm. I had a question as the mother of, of sons. Um, is there any room in this model in Frente or in your work for that alternative perspective? And I was thinking as you were speaking, there need not be. We already have Mary and Jesus and we have Oedipus. There are plenty of mothers and sons. But if you take it from the materialist perspective, then the model is something that has to do with the material engulfment of the complete other and potentially some form of either alienation or crossing over alienation. And I don't, I've read some Ferrante, but I don't remember this exploration. And I don't know if it's something you've considered. No, 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 not this. Um, not from this perspective, but uh, uh, if I had the time, through Ferrante or uh, via Ferrante, I reread the, the Second Sex by Simone de Beauvoir. Mm. Because the question of motherhood as a, a biological experience is uh, not alien to the feminist tradition. It has been the target of a very strong criticism. Mm. 
because of biology, motherhood uh, is a trap for women and uh, is something that contrasts freedom in the Beauvoir language existence, something that contrasts existence. And so by using literary texts of Ferrante, of Arnaud, Respector, uh, and so on, my goal, my aim is to challenge the Beauvoir uh, criticism of biology. I think that biology is not the devil. I think that biology, let's call it biology, I would call it zoology, but biology is the word, the Italian word, the English word. Uh, um, I think that biology is the field in which uh, we can rethink uh, the human being not as the master of creation or the masterpiece of creation, but uh, in his fragile belonging to the universe of life. Mm. And biology is the way. Can be metaphysic or something like that. Can be it. Thank you so much, um, Adriana. Uh, this is, as always, a wonderful, a wonderful presentation. The the uh, what I was wondering about is is in for in the in uh, Ferrante's Neapolitan tetralogy, the character of Lenou is also an author, and very. F I mean, I've read some of Annie Arnaud, um, and I'm the longer novel that I've read here. You know, she's not so obviously an author, but in the more recent works, like the fact that she's an author, that the narrative voice yeah. is an author plays an important role for both of these yeah. of these writers and so i'm i'm wondering if there's i mean what you think about about the generation of language which has a different kind of materiality from the generation of life how that like how do you how in your way of reading does the generation of language map onto this sort of zoological perspective for these two authors. I haven't read Lispector. I think she's on my she's on my list. <laughs> I think that um, I think that the the answer is uh, the way these uh, women novelists fight with language, forcing language to express blood and, and, uh, and experience of the body is a continuous fight because both Anirno and Ferrante, they continuously repeat uh, hmm, language is weak in expressing this kind of experience. And also Erno says, but I have to write it. I have to write it because my experience was an experience of the body uh, and uh, it could be, it had to be understood by other women and, and other bodies. Arnaud also says in this uh, short novel, The Happening, which is the description of her abortion when she was 20, she was a student, um, Mm. a material description of the abortion. Mm. And uh, she says, I'm sure that my narration is okay, is fine, because whenever I remember this experience, I always have in mind the same verbal expressions. She's just, you know, a, 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 a level with, with herself. And if you use this, uh, if you agree to use this word, labor, 
uh, writing labor. You also understand because uh, Ferrante says, uh, I'm writing from the womb. Which is Generally speaking, the feminist tradition, we have some uh, a defined version of it. Like mat motherhood is created because I generate a child, so we as women can be artists or writers because we generate the text. No, this is normal canon. And the Ferrante and Arnu, and especially the Spectre, they are different. They want the language to tell the truth. Of course, they are not so naive to, to really think that the language tells the truth. But uh, uh, the way they, they choose is to say the literary truth or the fictional truth, or the narrative truth. A way of, of showing of ma that they are not so naive to think that there is language, there is the object that language captures perfectly well the object. Of course, no, they know that. But they want the language to be in proximity of expressing a, a carnal, a visceral experience. This is my opinion. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation. I guess I have uh, uh, two questions. One is short and just I'm curious uh, to find out if uh, um, in your coming book, uh, on hypermaternity, there is also a place for Arendt's notion of natality. If a notion I've always found, I mean, I found it at first kind of bizarre, and then uh, I fell in love with this notion in Arendt because it so it qualifies a thought um, in such a in such a wonderful way. So this is the easy question. The other one is uh, is more. Um, <laughs> is a bit of a mess and but uh, I'm curious to find out if you think that the topic of mother daughter in Ferrante um, enhances the 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 sort of uh, her ability to represent an uncanny motherhood so mother daughter is opposed for example to mother son so to what extent the gender uh, in in the the process of procreation a generation does affect this enhanced uncanny effect because if I think for example of Madame Bovary yeah. uh, she is so disappointed uh, to have a daughter and not a son there is this implicit uh, sort of patriarchal and also psychoanalytic pseudo edipal satisfaction that the mother is supposed to have if uh, having 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 a son and and uh, uh, but uh, there are not that many sons in uh, in ferrante there are a few uh, there is uh, there is the son in uh, um, the days of abandonment but doesn't play a big role there is uh, the son yes yeah and Yes, many daughters and not that many sons. And in the Napolitan novels, Lila, uh, uh, Lila's son, even when he, when he dies, doesn't provoke a lot of pain. Yeah. And we know instead that when her daughter disappears, Tina, that's it. Yeah. So sorry for this long. <laughs> uh, and thank you, Alessia. Uh, the first question, in, in the book on hypermaternity, I touch on Arendt tangentially. Because she has this very problem that she is not very enthusiastic about the human body or the body. So <laughs> and, um, it is true that she it's so important for us uh, for focusing on the category of natality and birth. But on the other hand, she never mentioned the mother, she never mentioned the body, and also the child. Mm. A child uh, has been born unto us, but who is taking care of the child? We don't know. You know she is 
a problematic author. On the other question, of course, uh, you know better than I. And uh, in my opinion, uh, what Ferrante helps us uh, to focus on is uh, the complicity between uh, mother and daughter because of the generative body. For example, I, in the first novel, I think that the, the English title is Troubled Love. Tra, troubled Love? L'amore molesto, com'è? Uh, troubling Love. Troubling Love. Um, the protagonist goes to the funeral of the mother and during the funeral she has menstruation. All these continuous little signals of a relationship that is a, a bodily, bloody relationship, uh, a bit disgusting because and this also is, is an interesting topic. Um, because the, the experience of, the, of your dissolution of body, the experience of your body, your single body, to participate in the process of regeneration of Zoe can't but provoke disgust or horror, if you want, because it is an experience of dissolution. Mm. Not necessarily negative experience, but uh, through dissolution and through disgust, you can know, can have knowledge of your being part of a living world. I think so. I don't know. How to respond to this uh, knowledge of the, or just this sort of experience of horror? Even, I, I mean, I experience it very viscerally, even contemplating the notion that my body as a female could be subjected to this sort of, um, like, there's this impersonal life using your body, the space, and the matter to generate according to its own purposes, and like the life of the species, uh, de Beauvoir says, um, and it can be, I think, to, to think about this for too long can be debilitating. I find it sort of gets you into a passive mentality, or maybe it's just because it's so frightening and overwhelming, especially when you contemplate that for most of history, there's been no contraceptive, no, I mean, well, that's maybe an exaggeration, but in so many parts of the world, you know, it's, there really is no way to uh, like terminate a pregnancy and I mean I wonder when I think about this because there's this scene I think it's in book three of the Neapolitan novels when Lila's uh, describing this on the phone and all this visceral detail and Elena's sort of disgusted and she says that she just doesn't have this experience and Lila says each of us narrates her life as she chooses or something like that so th it's like it seems that the, the describing this experience or delving into it in a social context maybe has some sort of function or whether it's cathartic or something else um, and anyway that scene always sort of perplexed me because and I think it reminded me of maybe a danger that I get into in my own neurotic thinking yeah at, at any rate that's what I was wondering about how to like deal with this knowledge or experience in a way that's not um, uh, in a way that actually enriches your uh, life rather than just causing paralyzing fear yeah I, I understand what you mean but were you born or not? <coughs> of course, guess, you were yeah, born. Yeah. No. You were born, so you were, uh, you like me, like everybody here, is part uh, of this process of being born and of existing as a result of being born. And uh, you can think of it something debilitating, something horrible with no social, uh, you also said passive, it is not really passive. 
uh, it is a collaboration with nature and with the, with the process. It is not absolutely only passive, if you read this novel, it is a continuous complicity. Mm. A complicity by the human with nature. A complicity of rhythm. Com and um, it is the patriarchal tradition, I mean, that didn't give uh, this fact, the fact that all we are born, have been born, a big significance. It, was mar it is marginal for the, tra for the political tradition, if you want. It is absolutely marginal, that. Because the political tradition is not concerned with life uh, and with birth, but with power and with death and with war. So you have to choose, mm. or you have to imagine a different, Im a different field uh, of, uh, of, of values and of significance. Uh, and decide if it is worth to question the fact of being born and to, fact that, to question the fact that you are part of the living beings. And, uh, and then because you are born, to be sure your mother had a complicity with nature and with the process of generating. Is this interesting, politically interesting? I think so. The tradition is different. The philosophical tradition and the political philosophical tradition is centered on belligerent subject capable not of giving birth, but of giving deaths, uh, and so on. We know very well the, the patriarchal tradition. I think it is worth uh, investigating on this different field of research. Mm. But I understand what you mean. For young people, no? they're not enthusiastic <laughs> to be a generating body. <laughs> they want to be male and free without blood, <laughs> to spit the blood of the other, not your blood, the blood of the other. I understand. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, so my big takeaway from what you said is that the, an encounter with the uncanny is the uh, experience of the radical inexpressibility of disgust with the body and like the gruesomeness of that. So. My question has two parts. The first part is, um, what about the fact that the way we encounter disgust or feel disgust is historically specific? So I'm thinking about Iris Marion Young's essay, Menstrual Meditations, where she talks about, she kind of gives a historiography of the way in which women throughout time dealt with their periods and how um, as we enter into the 20th and then the 21st century there's this increasing sanitization of the experience of menstruation with the proliferation of uh, menstrual products where there's the expectation that um, menstrual blood is never seen or smelled or witnessed by anyone else but that wasn't necessarily the case 200 years ago. Um, and so does, that, does the fact that what we understand as gross or gruesome, our relationship to bodily fluids changes over time mean anything in relation to your argument? And then the second part of my question was, with regards to the inexpressibility bit of the argument, um, I was wondering why you focus on the inexpressibility of the gruesome and not on other aspects that other people oftentimes point to as inexpressible with regards to these things. So with birth and with menstruation, uh, pain is oftentimes, if not always, a co coterminous experience. Um, people experience pain when they give birth. And there's a whole literature on the inexpressibility of pain. But you seem to suggest that the inexpressibility of the uncanny extends beyond just uh, pain and reaches into this more general category of, of grossness. And I was wondering why. 
Uh, and for the, for the second question, I just followed the, the narrative plot of Ferrante and, uh, and they don't focus very much uh, on pain or giving birth, but just uh, on this experience of being part of a natural big process. And this is what is interesting philosophically for me. This is my interest is, is in that. Uh, as for the first part, uh, of course we have uh, different tradition and I mean different cultural scenarios, uh, uh, different from a religious point of view, social point of view, cultural point of view regarding the menstrual blood, uh, regarding the blood in general. Uh, and this is part of a patriarchal tradition, the impure, and so it is disgusting because it is impure, because it is smells, and so on, so on. Um, in modern uh, novelists, uh, contemporary novelists like Ferrante or no, or other novelists I read, um, they are, in a way, beyond this issue. Mm. So uh, they are considering the female body and blood uh, and pregnancy as something positive because it produces knowledge and experience. And this is why it is so interesting for me. Uh. And I think maybe I, I was not clear when I follow, when I follow Ferrante, for example, also Arnaud, in telling that language has a big problem to express the uncanny. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that the uncanny is like being in Heidegger and we cannot express it because he is transcendent and beyond. I mean that given our culture and given our language, which is a patriarchal culture and patriarchal tradition, we have a few words, not enough of words, for expressing the experience of motherhood and the uncanny, uncanny that is in the core of the experience of motherhood. But our language, or the language we are looking for, is always working in proximity in order to express it. There is nothing beyond or ineffable forever. I mean, I don't like metaphysics. I prefer this materialistic, naive approach to the question of being born and being alive. Because by being a, a, a reader of Plato, I have enough of philosophy of death. I want philosophy of birth. <laughs>